So I thought this was welcome to Christmas 2019. There's something about this picture that really fascinates me. These kids holding the joy sign, and you can see the joy written all over their faces, right? <laughs> but, but it was a great reminder to me that this is a season where there's a mixture of emotion. Though I've, I'm tired of hearing Christmas carols, I hear them in every store and every place I go. Joy to the world is really the message of the season. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that Christmas was my dad's happy season. There was never a season of the year when he was more filled with joy than Christmas. And even though that last Christmas was very different, when we arrived, I think maybe joy wasn't the right word to describe it, but I think there was a sense of relief that finally we were here to be with my mother while he went to the hospital. This week I was having coffee with a friend, and as I was driving to meet him, it all of a sudden hit me. He and his family, this is going to be a very different Christmas for them, because there's going to be four empty chairs at their table this year because they've lost family members or really close friends. They've lost four of them this year. And so this season of joy has this mixture of feelings that we go through, and it just, it, it's different. These kids kind of summarize it. They kind of express the fact that they're there to hold the joy sign, but they're not exactly excited about it. So the service planning team said, <clears throat> what can we do to enhance this season of joy? And we said, I think the best thing we could possibly do is we could take this absolutely powerful single verse from the Scriptures, spirit-lifting, encouraging verse, and we really focus on it, and that's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. We've been going through this over the past four weeks, and here it is. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Wonderful or... There's another great word, descriptive word for that. Mighty or powerful God, everlasting or eternal Father, Prince of Peace or Prince. Another expression for that is Prince of Wholeness. And on the first week, John Wilson was tasked with dealing with this wonderful counselor concept. And we really appreciate what John did because as a visitor to us and not knowing us, at least he knew that we live in a world where there is a great complexity of things going on. There, is a, uh, there are times when what's going on in our world we can't figure out. But even more significantly, there are times when we can't even figure out our own lives. We're not even clear, and we need someone to come in, be alongside of us, and give us some clear direction and support. Week two, Glenn Hart was tasked with helping us understand what this everlasting or eternal father was like and why that was so important in God's promise to us. Many of us were very fortunate to have really good dads, but even the best of dads disappoint from time to time. The very best dad will disappoint from time to time. And that's why Isaiah knew that it was important for us to have a heavenly father who longs not only for closeness with us, but promises he'll never go away. Last week, Shane introduced you to this Prince of Peace or Prince of Wholeness. Now, folks, we have a problem. You were way too affirming of Shane. He got a really swelled head. And it was hard to live with him this week. And Connie Hale Duncan was the one that really drove the nail in the coffin when she had her sermon evaluation form and she gave it to Shane and she said, I gave you a 95. That was out of 100. Do you understand why it went to his head? 96 today. No, 96. He says, yeah, Chuck, you got to do 96. Put away the sheet, Connie. Um, <laughs> so, so on a serious note, let me say this. Many of you, because I had conversation with a number of you, Many of you went away with a phrase that was a gift from Shane to you, and the phrase was this. Don't seek peace, seek Jesus, because he will be the one who gives you peace. 
Is that, do you remember that phrase? Those of you who are here? And so that became a gift to many of us. And so it's my challenge this morning to introduce you to a strong or mighty God. That asks, causes me to ask a question, and the question is this. Have you ever been part of a conversation where you heard this statement made? Christianity is only for weak people. How many have ever, ever heard somebody say that? Christianity is only for weak people. And my question to you is, do you believe that's true or not? Do you believe that's true or not? I'm going to cast my, my vote with the, what I think the Apostle Paul said to us. I'm going to cast my vote that I believe it's, the statement is true. Because Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27, he wrote these words. Take a look, good friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and best among you, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks, exploits, and abuses, chooses nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. In another translation it says, God deliberately chose the weak to confound the strong. God deliberately chose the simple to confuse the wise. And so my vote goes there, and I believe that yes, in fact, Christianity in many ways is really for weak people, and that's why Isaiah, writing many years ago, wrote about this particular concept. And the word that was used in Hebrew in the original is this. The word is El Gabor. El Gabor. And so in English it gets translated mighty or strong, but the real sense and the literal sense of the Hebrew El Gabor is this. God is a warrior. God is a warrior. Several years ago, my brother convinced me to go to a high school reunion in my hometown of Wingham. I don't know why I ever gave in to him. Because when I walked into the gymnasium at the high school that day, the first person who greeted me was a woman who I could not even remember, and she said this. Do you remember the day I beat you up in grade six? <laughs> I just wanted to turn and leave. And from that day to this day, I've longed to know that there was somebody who was willing to go to battle for me. And that's why Isaiah says this. Years ago, years ago, Isaiah said, I want to introduce you to someone who's a warrior who will go to battle for you. And I don't think it's any big stretch of the imagination to think that there might be some of you here today in the middle of a battle. It might be a relational battle. It might be a, an emotional battle. It might be physical. It might be financial. But no matter, it might even in, impact another area of your life altogether. But in the midst of that, you know this morning that what you need is the presence of a really strong and mighty God willing to go to battle for you. So here's where we're going to go with this. How do, you how do you get to the place where you know that there's a strong, mighty God that's going to show up in your life at a moment when you most need it? And I got four suggestions, so here they are. Number one is stop pretending. Stop pretending. I'm so grateful I finally get to live in a time when people in the military the law enforcement community, the medical community, and even other areas of career pursuit are willing to say we're no longer going to pretend that what we do for a pro as a profession doesn't have an impact, a, a critical and negative impact on our emotional lives. Because for a long time in all of those professions and in others, there were people who were willing to say, you can't admit that you're struggling with anything because there's a stigma to that. And I think we've finally reached the point where the stigma is beginning to wear off and people are willing to say, 
if you're struggling emotionally or spiritually in some sense, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of you being willing to acknowledge. So, um, I have a really silly question. I'm known for those. Do you think it's easier for men or women to admit weakness? You ready to vote? Guys, it's starting to feel uncomfortable in here, isn't it? But even, guys, I think this is true. Even in, it's not good for our ego, but even in our moments of most brutal honesty, most of us would have to admit, admit we know the answer to that, even though we don't like the answer to that. So I want to make an observation. And I draw on one of my favorite authors. Her name is Bell Hooks. And you'll notice that something when this comes up, Bell Hooks doesn't even capitalize her name. You do have that, I think, David, don't you? Don't have that. Yeah, there it is. Bell Hooks doesn't even capitalize her name. She's an Afro-American feminist. And she writes some very powerful things. And she talks about one of the things that she is most important to her, is her, to her is she talks about the importance of a dad, in a, especially in a young boy's life, but I also believe that's true in a young girl's life. And this is the observation she makes. When men gather together at work, they rarely have meaningful conversations. They jeer, they grandstand, they joke, but they do not share feelings. They relate in a scripted way, careful to remain within the emotional bounds set by patriarchal thinking about masculinity, about masculinity. That's Bill Hooks. But guys, I do have this bit of good news. Pretending that everything's okay is not just a game that men play, it's often a game that women play as well. And we'll never get to experience the power of a mighty warrior, God, in our lives until we stop pretending. Now, the second step in this, and these are put together very intentionally, the second stage of this is start acknowledging. Start acknowledging. I am, um, I've often told you about my favorite mentor, Terry Wardle. Recently, he wrote a book called Some Kind of Crazy. And in that book, he recalls a time when he was designated as the chief executive officer of a large seminary in college. He describes it this way, and I'm going to quote him. This was the greatest affirmation I ever received. Well, listen carefully as he goes on. This was the greatest affirmation I ever received, and I was far too wounded to say no. And it wasn't long before things got worse. I'll let him describe it in his own words, and they are these. One day, someone handed me a collection of written protests a few of which were brutal. People like Terry Wardle eventually abandon the faith or become psychopaths, one read. Another one. I will rejoice when I see his ministry in ashes. And then his personal favorite. Terry Wardle is like a piece of apple pie with dead flies mixed into savory cinnamon. Now, isn't that great? Wouldn't you love to receive those notes? And then he makes this observation. Nasty as they were, these relentless personal attack had hit the bullseye of my chronic insecurity. I was crushed. It wasn't just the 34-year-old man they were hitting it, hitting. Without knowing it, my attackers were assaulting a small boy who was still trapped in an emotional firestone caused years before by unhealed trauma. A healthy person would have found the situation challenging, but to an unhealed man like myself, it was devastating. I'd like to report that that was a moment of real change and turn in Terry's life, but it would come many years later. It would come many years later when he became even more successful 
but he ended up in a psychiatric hospital. And it was in that psychiatric hospital that he'd finally come face to face with the lingering impact of his childhood woundings that had played out so strongly in his adult life. I tell you Terry's story because I suspect in many ways it's no different than the story that's written on your life or my life. It's challenging. It's challenging to finally admit and acknowledge that I can't do this on my own. I need a warrior who can come into my life and do the work that only a warrior can do. Let me summar summarize it this way. When we open our, ourselves to the need for a defining work of a mighty God in our lives, our greatest potential is realized. When we open ourselves to the need for a defining work of a mighty God, our greatest potential finally begins to emerge. That's why we stop pretending, we start acknowledging. And the third part of this is simply this. We start positioning. I have a favorite story in the Old Testament. I think it's my all-time favorite. And it's recorded for us in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18. It's a story of a guy by the name of Elijah. And he's really faithful to the ways of God. He's really consistent in trying to pursue that way, that, his way. And he particularly is troubled because there are other people around him that are encouraging people to pursue other gods. And he decides this has to come to a head. We have to do something to make this, to get this resolved. And so what he does is he says, I'm the only prophet of God left in Israel, and there are 450 prophets of Baal. So here's a deal. Let the Baal prophets bring up two oxen, let them pick one, butcher it, and lay it on an altar of firewood, but don't ignite it. I'll take the other ox, cut it up, lay it on the wood, but neither will I light the fire. Then you pray to your gods, and I'll pray to God. And the God who answers with fire will prove to be, in fact, God. Now, if you know the rest of the story, you know what happened. I, I remember... I have to tell this story. It's not in the script. In my earliest days of this serving this church, I wanted to tell this story and really delve into it. <coughs> and in those days, the Living Bible had just been released. And I was fascinated by reading that Bible. And in this story, as it begins to unfold, the prophets of Baal lay out their ox, and they cry out to the gods of Baal to ignite the fire, and nothing happens. And this is one of Elijah's great moments, because Elijah says, so what's wrong? Why can't your gods deliver? And the Living Bible, in its rough translation of that, said, Elijah said to them, perhaps he's out sitting on the toilet. And I had a woman greet me at the door afterwards, and she said, if you ever read that story again, I'll never come back. And I said, well, too bad it's in the Bible. So the story is, as it unfolds, as the, the prophets of Baal cry out to God and nothing happens with their fire, Elijah cries out to his god, El Gabor, the one warrior god, willing to go to battle. And there's a great fire erupts. That's all, that's all part of what it was he was doing. He was simply positioning himself to allow a mighty God. Elijah knew that he had no power to light a fire. And so he made it all a God deal. And you and I moved to a really healthy place in our lives. When we embrace this one that, the Eli that Elijah spoke about years before he ever showed up on this planet, the one able to be a wonderful counselor, 
an everlasting Father, a Prince of Peace, and a mighty powerful God in our lives. And my final thought is this. Stop apologizing. Stop apologizing. I want to show you a picture and see if you recognize this picture. Some of you recognize this family? In the back row are John and Wendy Ream. What, the people that are not in that picture are their three birth sons. But there's some other significant people because on the back left you'll see a black kid. His name is Josiah. Actually, they call him Joey. Currently, Joey's been driving go-karts and racing in British Columbia, and they call him the chocolate rocket. But if you never had a chance to read Joey's story, the book is in the library, and it's a story of an amazing thing. Because when John was really young, growing up in this congregation, everybody was convinced, and John himself was convinced, that he was going to pursue a career in medicine. And then one day, he got a call from God, and the call was to serve him among the people of Africa. And so John married Wendy, and off they went to Nigeria, and they began to serve there in a community. Well, they began to create a, a ministry there called ACTS, African Center for Theological Studies. They continue that work to this day. But on one occasion, a person showed up at the door with little Joey. They'd taken him off of a dump where he'd been left by his mother, abandoned by his mother. And they said to John and Wendy, perhaps you know what to do with a child like this. And the story of Wendy as she tries to pursue permission to adopt this child is a story you have to read. It's incredible tenacity on her part. But God wasn't done doing something in their lives. And then he began to introduce them to a series of four young women who became part of their family and their lives as well. So they actually are looking at eight kids and still doing ministry. Wendy does an amazing ministry among women. So why did I tell you that story? I told you that story because I remember the conversations that went on during the days when John had announced his decision that he was no longer going to pursue a career in medicine. Instead, he was going to respond to a call that God had placed on his life to serve the people of Africa. Among the people who weren't exactly convinced that this was a good idea was his dad. In fact, his dad would say to me, well, since my son's going into ministry, I'm going to make your son a stock car driver. That's what he threatened me with. I tell you that story because of this. Never once did I hear John apologize for the decision to not pursue medicine, but to pursue a higher calling. I didn't state that right. Let me take that back. Pursuing medicine is indeed pursuing a higher calling. John didn't once apologize for pursuing what God had in mind for him instead of a career in medicine. And I want to conclude with this thought, that if you and I are really eager to have a warrior God show up in our lives, there's a process we go through, and that is we stop pretending. We start acknowledging that there's only one way that God is going to really show up in our lives and make a difference. And we embrace that. I need that because I'm not capable. We start positioning ourselves so that he can do the work that only he can do in our lives. And then we, start, we stop apologizing. We have no reason to apologize because in our weakness, he becomes strong. So I want to conclude with this thought. 
There's some of you here this morning that can, if you've listened carefully, I'm sure that God's Spirit has said something to you about a place in your life where you'd really like a strong God to show up. And I'm going to ask you, can I pray for you? And if I pray for you, and there'll be people down here after the service to pray for you as well, but if I pray for you, I want to know who I'm praying for. How many of you would be willing to say, there's an area in my life which I wouldn't mind if a really strong, mighty God would show up to do battle for me? How many would you be willing to say that? Can I see your hands? Okay. I'll be praying for you. Because you just acknowledged your need for that. And that's a great step forward in the process. So let's pray. Father, I'm glad that you delivered on your promise. That Jesus became the one that Isaiah would speak about, that would be for us a wonderful counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace, and a mighty strong God. And I'm glad for that. But this morning, the thing that we've focused in on, and you've spoken into our hearts, is this. There's some of us here this morning that would be willing to acknowledge we need you to show up in a powerful way in an area of our lives. And you saw the hands. You saw the hands of people who said, that's what I need. And I pray that you would honor that. And my prayer is for those folk. Would you become for them, even this week, the strong, mighty Il Gabor of their lives? For the sake of Christ, who came to be that one for us. Amen.